At the conclusion of this lecture, you will be able to distinguish between employees and the self-employed. You will understand the nature of the contract of employment and common law and statutory duties placed on the employer and the employee. Employment law in the United Kingdom is mainly statute-based and has been influenced in particular by membership of the European Union and the development of anti-discrimination legislation. Not all employment law can be found in legislation, however. There have also been significant case law developments in this area of law, and as a result, there are a number of common law principles that must be in place for employment contracts. We will examine both the statute and common law principles of employment law in more detail later on in the presentation. There are three main categories of worker in the UK. The self-employed, also referred to as an independent contractor, agency workers, and employees. And each category enjoys different employment protection rights. We will now examine each category in turn. So what is an independent contractor? An independent contractor is someone who is in business on their own account and who is responsible for making their own decisions as to how the job is performed. There are advantages for both the employer and the individual in having a relationship of this nature. The employer is freed from most statutory employment protection legislation and the individual enjoys a favourable tax position. Agency workers are those workers who are employed or engaged by an employment agency, which then supplies their services to the hirer. Although the hirer will owe certain statutory duties, for example, duties under the discrimination and health and safety legislation, it will not owe the agency worker many of the employment protection rights enjoyed by employees. Agency workers are generally used for temporary engagements although it is not uncommon for engagements to last for several months or even years. Case law has emphasized, however, that if an agency worker is used by a hirer for an extended period and other facts point to an employer-employee relationship, the agency worker may be able to claim employment rights directly against the hirer, even if there is no contract directly between the agency worker and the hirer. Now turning towards the issue of employees. The majority of workers in the UK are employees of the company to which they provide their services. Unlike in some EU countries, there is no legal distinction between blue-collar workers, white-collar workers and senior directors, other than whatever may be written into their employment contracts. The basic principles of the common law and statutory employment protection legislation apply to all employees regardless of their status. As long as they satisfy the relevant qualifying conditions, employees will benefit from greater statutory employment protection rights than independent contractors and agency workers. In particular, after one year's service, an employee will benefit from the right to not be unfairly dismissed. It can be difficult to make the distinction between an independent contractor and an employee. In practice, this distinction depends on many factors. Aids to assist making the distinction come from both Parliament in the form of statutory guidance and through judicial decisions under common law. Statutory aids. The Employment Rights Act 1996 defines an employee as an individual who has entered into or works under a service contract or apprenticeship. This isn't very helpful as it still leaves a number of questions. For example, how is a service contract or apprenticeship defined in the statute? A contract of employment is one of personal service. Thus, if the individual working can delegate his task or substitute a replacement, then the essential element of personal service is missing. The courts look at the reality of the situation and may ignore titles or labels given to the worker. The courts have devised tests to help make the distinction, but no one single test is conclusive. These tests tend to be vague and sometimes difficult to apply in marginal cases. We will now examine the various tests established by the courts.
The control test. If there is evidence to show that the employer had control not only of what work was done, but also how, when, and where the work was done, may indicate an employee-employer arrangement. If this control cannot be established, then the worker may be an independent contractor. One drawback of this approach is that as technology and industry have developed, specialised skilled workers are often not under the direct control of their employers due to their unique skills. For example, in the medical profession, when hospital managers are unable to control their surgeons to a great extent. The integration test. Is there evidence to show the worker is part and parcel of the business? Is his work an integral part of the business? If so, then the worker may well be an employee. If not, he may be an independent contractor. What is meant by an integral part of the business? This phrase can be hard to define. This test runs into problems if businesses contract out their services. For example, councils obtain the services of refuse collection businesses. Here, the question is, should rubbish collectors be considered to be employed by the council or by the company which is contracted by the council to collect the rubbish? A good case on point here is Lee versus Chung. The multiple or economic reality test. As no one test has been found to fit all cases and categorically determine the status of a worker, under this test, all the facts of the case are considered, including whether the worker was working on his own account, did the worker agree to provide his own work and skill in return for a wage or other payment. A worker who can send a substitute to do his work is most unlikely to be an employee. Did the worker agree expressly or impliedly that he will be under the control of the person paying for his work? Are the rest of the terms of the arrangement consistent with a contract of employment? Whilst this test gives flexibility to the courts, it does increase uncertainty as it allows judges to subjectively weigh evidence. There is no requirement for a contract of employment to be in writing. All employees, whether or not they have ever been given a written document called a contract, will be employed under a contract of employment. The terms of a contract of employment can be express or implied. Express terms are those that are agreed between the parties. The agreement may have been verbal when the offer of employment was made or may have been recorded in writing. Implied terms are terms which have not been agreed between the parties but which nevertheless form part of the contract of employment. These terms are implied into the contract of employment either to make the contract workable because of custom or practice or because of a particular piece of legislation. Although where the implied term is necessary to give effectiveness to the contract, the implied term will take precedence over the express term as held in the case of Johnston v. Bloomsbury Health Authority. Employers and employees have responsibilities to each other they should also expect their rights to be upheld. These rights are found through both statutory provisions and common law principles. It must be stated that sometimes an employee only gains a right when they have been employed by their employer for a certain length of time. We will now examine the rights and responsibilities under statutory provisions and common law in turn. Under Section 1 of the Employment Rights Act 1996, Employees are entitled to receive a written statement of terms and conditions of employment. The statement must be provided within two months of the commencement of the employment and must include certain prescribed information. Other rights include the right to an itemized payslip. This applies from the day the employees start work. The right to be paid at least the national minimum wage. This applies from the day the employee starts work. The right not to have illegal deductions made from pay. This applies from the day the employee starts work. The right to paid holiday. Full-time employees are entitled to at least 28 days a year. Part-time employees are entitled to a pro rata amount. 
the right time off for trade union duties and activities. This applies from the day the employee starts work. The time off does not necessarily have to be paid. Employees also have the right to be accompanied by a trade union representative to a disciplinary or grievance hearing. If an employee takes part in official industrial action and is dismissed as a result, this will be an automatically unfair dismissal. The right to paid time off work to look for work if being made redundant. This applies once the employee has worked for two years for that employer. The above list is not exhaustive, but for the purposes of the ACCA exam, it is useful to be familiar with some. As already stated, although employment law is a very statute-based subject governed particularly by the Employment Rights Act of 1996, there are underlying common law rules that apply and have effect in any employment relationship. Such rules apply to both employer and employee as indicated in the following slides. To provide work, the employer normally will be expected to provide work for the employee based on the employee's skills and to train the employee where it is required for a specific task. No breach of this implied duty will occur so long as the employee continues to be paid, even though there may be no work available. To pay wages. Normally, the rate of pay is expressly stated in the contract of employment. However, in the absence of an express provision, the law will impose the duty to pay a reasonable remuneration of the work done. Where workers in the pursuit of an industrial dispute offer only part performance by working to rule or adopting a go-slow policy, the employer can refuse to accept such part performance and can refuse to make any payment for work done. To indemnify the employee. Where the employee, in the course of his or her employment, incurs any legal liability or necessary expenses on behalf of the employer, the employee is entitled to be indemnified or reimbursed. Mutual respect. The employment relationship is assumed to be based on mutual respect, trust, and confidence, and the employer must not act in a way calculated to damage such mutuality. To provide a safe system of work. This is also required by health and safety statutes. At common law, the employer is required to take reasonable care for the health and safety of his employees. Failure to comply will render the employer liable for an action in negligence. The duty extends to the provision of competent fellow employees, safe plant and equipment, a safe place of work and a safe system of work. If the employer has taken all reasonable steps to comply with the duty of care, then they will not be liable for any injury sustained. There are a number of implied duties imposed on employees, which may all be understood as deriving from their relationship of trust and confidence with their employer, and the consequential duty of loyalty and faithful service that derives from that relationship. The specific duties are as follows. To act faithfully. This is the fundamental duty and it covers such aspects of not passing on information derived from one's employment to outsiders and not competing with the employer, either directly or indirectly. The courts are reluctant to accept that what workers do in their spare time should be of any concern to their employer. However, sometimes an employer's interests may be harmed by an employer's spare time work if this involves direct competition with the employer's business. An employee may not do anything while still employed, which is in breach of the duty to act faithfully. However, it is perfectly lawful for ex-employees to canvass customers of their former employer after leaving service. Moreover, they are entitled to make use of any knowledge and skills acquired while in the former employer's business, apart from such information which can be classified as a trade secret. In this sense, the implied duty of confidentiality for ex-employees is narrower than in the case of an existing employee. To obey reasonable orders. Employees must obey any reasonable and lawful instruction given to them by their employer. Whether any instruction fulfills these criteria is a matter of fact in each instance. The classic case in this area is Pepper versus Webb in which a gardener not only indicated that he was not willing to follow an instruction, but actually swore at his employer. 
In a subsequent action, it was held as the order was both lawful and reasonable, the gardener had breached his implied duty. To use skill and care. Should an employee not exercise the level of skill and care that may reasonably be expected, then they will not only be liable to dismissal, but they may also lose the protection of the employer's duty to indemnify them for losses, and be made personally liable for claims for compensation. The classic case in this instance is Lister v. Rumford Ice and Cold Storage Limited, in which an employee lorry driver, rather than his employer, was held liable to compensate a fellow worker due to his gross negligence in driving his lorry, which was held to breach his implied duty of skill. To not take bribes or make a secret profit. This duty almost goes without saying, as an example of the general duty of good faith, but it covers the situation where an employee has received money or gifts from customers or clients. In conclusion, you will now know that there are three types of workers, self-employed, independent contractors, agency workers, and employees. Each type is afforded with certain protections. The courts have created three tests to determine whether a worker is an employee or a self-employed independent contractor, and they are the control test, the integration test, and the economic reality test. An employment contract need not be in writing. Both employers and employees have certain rights and duties under statutory provisions and common law principles.